I want to give you a quick and dirty introduction to set theory for linguists. Instead of focusing on a lot of technical stuff, we're going to focus more so on the application of how these things work in linguistics and how we can look at these through a linguistics lens. So set theory is all about sets and a set is just any collection of objects and whatever objects are in that set, we call them elements. So you might think of something like the set of English stops if you think about the IPA. You can give it a full name like English stops or we could just give it a single letter to make things easy. We do curly braces around our set that tells us we have a set and then we just list all of our elements. So we know that in English we have P, we have T, we have K, we have B, we have D, we have G. And because we're being fancy, we'll include the glottal stop as well. So this would be our set of English stops. And a lot of times you'll see these represented as circles. Just close that there. It's like a circle with a protrusion. It's got a tumor on it. So we can just write all of our elements in the set like this. Doesn't matter where we put them but this would be our set of English stops. And just to make it clear, sometimes we put the letter above it. So we have things in our set. This is like a classification method. And we have things that are not in our set. So for example, we could say that P is an element of E. So this would mean that P is in our set English stops. And we use this little epsilon sign, to say is an element of. If we have something that's not in our set, so let's say we're looking at the sound F, well, that's a fricative, not a stop, then we would write that F is not an element of E, which is our set of English stops. So we can use sets as classification systems to talk about certain groups of objects, like our English stops, our English vowels, uh, all the nouns, all the countable nouns, all the uncountable nouns, the verbs, the state verbs, the factive verbs, and so on. So if we know how many elements are in our set, then we can count them using what's called the cardinality. So the cardinality tells us how many things are in our set. So in this case, we put little bars around it, and we'd say that the cardinality of E, which is our English stops, would be seven in this case, because we have seven distinct elements. Now, there's a couple of conventions with sets, and that is that they're unordered. So here I'm gonna be a little bit more abstract and just use numbers and, sorry, letters, A, B, and C. So if we have a set that contains the letters A, B, C, it doesn't matter what order we put them in. So this can be the same thing as C, B, A. And that's because in a representation as a circle, we don't really have an order in a circle. So you can use that visual method to help reaffirm that bit. Sets are also non-repetitive. We don't care how many times an element is in our set, we just care whether an element is in there or not. So if I give you a set with A repeated four times, this is really just the same thing as a set with A once. And A is an element of our set, nothing else is an element of our set. We don't care about the fact that it appears four times. So the cardinality of this set, if I call this capital A, Regardless of whether we take a look at the one on the left or the right, its cardinality is one. It has one element, one member, and that is A. Uh, sets can also be empty. So you can imagine a circle with nothing in it. Now there's two ways we can write this. We can write this as curly braces with nothing inside, but the typical convention is this notation here, which is the empty set. So it's a circle with a line through it. And that just means that there's nothing in our set. So this could be like the intersection in English of, um, I don't know, all nouns that are also always verbs at the same time. We know that there's nothing that's a noun and a verb at the same time. Uh, all you smarties out there saying gerunds, those are nouns, those are not verbs. Uh, but yeah, you can think of an empty set as being like a set with nothing in it. So sets by themselves are kind of boring, but we can introduce the concept of subsets and make things a little bit more interesting. So we say that A is a subset of B if all the elements in A are in B. I'm gonna give you an abstract example first. So let's say we have our set A here with the elements A and B, and then we have another set B 
with the elements a, b, and c. So we can write this out. We can say a and b. We can put our other set a, b, and c here. We can see that a, b is a subset of a, b, c because each of these elements a and b are also in our bigger set. So in this case, a is a subset of b. And you can draw this with circles. So you'll notice that a circle is always contained inside a larger circle if you have subsets. So an example linguistically that you can think about is the sentence, all dogs are happy. What this is really saying is that all of the dogs are a subset of things that are happy. So you can imagine, uh, this is our set of dogs here. It has a bunch of different members. If we say that all dogs are happy, what that means is that if we take a look at the set of all happy things out there, all of the dogs are going to be contained in it. So of course we have other happy things out in our world, but we notice that all of the dogs are going to be inside this set. So when you think of a sentence like all dogs are happy, what you're really saying is that the set of dogs is contained within the set of happy things. So this is an example of a subset that's more linguistic in nature. We also have things called power sets and power sets are interesting. So I want to imagine a set that contains elements A and B. This is the set A. What we say is that the power set of A is the set of all possible combinations of subsets. So for example, if I'm thinking about A and B, I could ask, who do I want to pick for a committee out of A and B? Well, I could have a committee where I pick nobody. So it's just an empty set. I don't have anyone in a committee. But maybe A volunteers. So maybe I have a committee with just A. So I have the set containing A as an element of my power set. Let's say I have B who wants to be in the committee, but not A. Well, then I have the set containing B as an element of my power set. Now let's say both of these people, A and B, want to be in the committee. Well, then I have a set containing A and B as an element. So you can think about this power set as just being all possible ways of picking our members from A. I can pick none of them, we just pick one of them, we pick two of them. If A has three members, we could pick three of them, and so on. So the power set gets larger for the more elements you have in your original set A. So a committee is a very real-world example of a power set. But we could also think of pronouns, specifically they when it comes to power sets. So imagine we have three people, uh, Mark, Ken, and Sue. So we'll do this under the they thing. When we say they, we know there's a few things that they can refer to. They can refer to just one person. We could have singular they. So they could be Mark, Ken, or Sue. They could be referring to a combination of two of those or they could be referring to all three people. So when we think about they, and let's just say that this is the set that all contain people. When we think about a pronoun they, how we can represent this is the power set of our people minus the fact that we can't have uh, anyone. So people is gonna give us all co possible combinations of Mark, Ken, and Sue, but we know that they has to refer to at least one person, so we can take the power set of people to generate all of the possible combinations of those people and then remove the case where we're not referring to anybody. And now this is how we could represent our pronoun, they in English. If we were to have something like a pronoun he, we don't really need to have uh, the power set here. What we would just do is we'd end up taking just the singletons. So in this case, he could be either Mark on his own or Ken on his own. We wouldn't need to take a power set or consider possible combinations. Um, so, you know, we could just list out the singletons there. But I think this is a nice application of power sets that typically isn't introduced when you learn about power sets, but it's, it's a very good tool for them looking at they in English because it's both singular and plural. Now there's one more thing we should talk about, and that'll be the end of your quick and dirty introduction. And these are set operations. So this is when we take a set 
and we look at another set and we do some operations on them to get different meanings. So the first one is the complement. And you can think about having a universe where your set A is there. And what the complement does, we do A bar, it just looks at everything outside of that set. So try not to overlap on the A bar there. But in the example, we could think about the complement of dogs. If dogs is everything that is a dog, then the complement of dogs is not dogs. So uh, if I want to talk about all the things that are not dogs, I can just take the complement of dogs. In terms of the intersection, imagine we have two sets here, A and B. Our intersection is everything that is both A and B. And we use an upside down U to symbolize that. So let's say we want to talk about the things that are both brown and dogs. So in other words, a shorter form for this would be saying brown dogs. Well, this is really just a combination of taking a look at all of the elements that overlap in the set of brown things and all the things that overlap in our dogs. So this picks out all of the dogs that are brown, or alternatively, all of the brown things that are dogs. What the union does is it does something a little bit similar to the intersection, but I think about it as a less picky intersection, because this just takes everything that is either A or B. We use a U for this, A union B. So if we did brown union dogs, what I'm taking a look for are all the things that are brown or a dog or both. So it's just saying, I just want something that's brown or a dog. So just give me one of those things. So maybe you get a table because it's brown. Maybe you get a white dog. Or maybe you get a dog that's brown. That's fine. It's kind of like saying, you know, what would you like? And then you end up saying, well, what I really want is either tea or coffee. So you just have to look for one of those two things. Maybe you get a milk tea with coffee. That could be possible. The last thing to take a look at, I had union written down here, but it's a difference. So when you take a difference of something, we can draw this out. So let's say we have A here and B here, and we want to take a look at A minus B. We're taking a look at all of the things that are in A, but not in B. So for example, if I wanted to take brown minus dog, or the difference of brown and dog, what I'm asking for are all the things that are brown, but not dogs. So I want something brown, but I want something that is not a dog. And you can think of this kind of similar to what we did with the power set before. We took the power set of people and we took out the case where we had the empty set. So we want some combination of the people in our original set, but we don't want nobody when we talk about they. We want at least one person in that set. So uh, this is an application of the difference. So this feels quick and dirty. I know in your actual linguistics courses, you probably do some more technical stuff with sets. And I have a lot of videos under my discrete math series on the channel if you want more details about set theory um, in terms of like the actual technical details and lots of exercises. But for the sake of linguistics, this is really all you need to understand both lexical semantics and truth conditional semantics. The rest you can kind of pick up as you go along. So in the next video, we'll talk about Cartesian products, relations, and functions. We'll move into propositional logic after that, and then we'll start actually learning some formal semantics and some lexical semantics. So if you enjoyed the video, please like, comment, subscribe, all that fun stuff. If you have questions, you can put them in the comments below, and I hope to see you in the next one.